here in the New York area and how folks are doing. We were talking earlier at the beginning of the show about social distancing and about how it seems that here in North Carolina there is reports that we're doing fairly well and that they're actually saying that our numbers may be down from what was predicted, but I don't know how that is going in terms of the rest of the country. So does it seem like social distancing is working up there in the Northeast? Are people actually practicing, as uh, Dean likes to talk about it, the actual daily washing of the hands and the wearing of the mask and things of that nature, and uh, are people finding innovative ways to wear the mask? <laughs> well, I think yes to all. So. Uh... We are sorry to be one of the leaders in the country on this, and but we are hoping that the rest of the country learns from the early mistakes in New York. So I think we didn't practice social distancing early enough, and you saw that huge peak uh, in cases and unfortunately in deaths and sort of an overwhelming number of very, very sick patients coming into the healthcare system that was not really well prepared. Um, I think it's very hard to prepare for something this dramatic. But now we finally have a couple of uh, blips in the news of some decreasing numbers. Uh, all the schools in the area are closed. All the um, uh, un non-essential workers are staying home. Um, and that's really helping because we have an area, as you know, about – a total of about 8 to 10 million people move about on a normal day in and out of New York and the environs going about their business on public transportation, in cars, on bikes, on foot. And so now with the, the vast majority staying home, including students and teachers and uh, shop uh, assistants and, you know, people, lawyers, nobody who who – doesn't exactly have to be at work should be there. We're seeing um, that social distancing seems to be driving the numbers down. I'll tell you, people have, once we figured out that this was real, and everything takes a little bit to catch up to, uh, once we figured out that this was real, people have been very good about there's no more handshakes, there's no more hugs. People are doing their best to maintain at least six feet, if not longer, distance between each other. People are starting to wear masks a lot, particularly when they have to be close to other people on a bus or a subway or in a grocery store. Um, and I think um, we're seeing maybe the fruits of those labors in the numbers dipping down a little bit just now. Well, that's good to know that the numbers are dipping down. Now, you know, for a long time, the America was very much of a social kind of town and social environments. I think about all the times of the sports worlds and the different handshakes and the daps and the different things that the entertainers came up with and things of that nature. Do you think that this is going to have a long impact where we will see more and more of this kind of social distancing even after we get out of the uh, pandemic, and who knows how long that'll be. And is there any time frame as to when the experts are predicting that we might start to see a decline and a opportunity for life back to normal? Are we thinking six months? Are we thinking a year? Or um, I think that uh, somebody had said that they had heard from Dr. Fauci, I guess online or something, that it might even wind up being a seasonal thing. So what are, what is the current model saying as to what this will look like say, a year from now, and in terms of its impact on just general culture? Because like I said, a lot of those things that you were talking about, people had been doing for years all the time, uh, and I think they've gotten used to doing it, whether it was a business handshake or whether it was the athletes doing the DAP thing or things of that nature. But it sounds like after we get out of this, we're going to have to curtail even from that so that we don't bring it back in terms of bringing back the symptoms and everything and bringing back uh, something of this drastic na of a nature. Uh, I think you're right. I think we're learning a lot from this. I think, you know, as, as you said, with my name, my ethnicity, I'm an American, but my ethnicity is Indian, and nobody goes around hugging and kissing in India, you know, to say hello. We, you know, say namaste, or in Japan they bow. I think we're going to see a lot more sort of non-touch business greetings uh, going on, which is not uh, unreasonable. I think it's really hard not to celebrate a victory on a on a sports field, right? It's really hard not to not to chest bump or do a dap or do something. Uh, but I think we're going to see people changing that bit by bit. I think we're going to see that 
employers um, who can minimize the commute for their employees will, while still getting, you know, the right amount of work done, uh, might start, we may see more telecommuting, we may see a little bit less need for what they call FaceTime at the office, you know, if you're not necessarily have to be there. Um, I don't, I mean, it, looking at the projections, we're going to be back partial working, I think, in a month, month and a half. It looks like it from now uh, up here, but I think, you know, our economy is going to take a while to recover from this, as you know. Yes, it definitely sounds like the economy is going to take a long time to recover. I mean, I'm glad that the stimulus package passed, but even with that, and then you have to figure out when the stimulus is come to people and also um, then that stimulus money then getting circulated back into the economy. So it definitely seems like the economy is going to take a while in order to have a cure and everything. I'm also wondering if it's not maybe going to change the nature about the way that we do things. Because like I said, I mean, definitely we talk about certain sports will never change. Basketball will always be basketball. Football will always be a contact sport. But even like, um, I don't know, Scott, have you thought about the fact of after this changes, will we see bands keeping six feet apart from each other in order to like maybe change the nature of the way that the bands are configured? Because right now, a lot of times the bands are right up on each other. The band mates are right up on each other. Man, I hope not. <laughs> I mean, I hope eventually we can get back to being able to set up close to each other, uh, particularly the kind of music I play. Well, I mean, I play all kinds of music, but if I'm just playing with like a folk singer, like if I'm working with Bruce Piaf, you know, he's playing acoustic guitar and singing. I, I want to be close to him so I can hear what he's doing. I, I want to hear it from him, not from a monitor speaker or, or a PA. And the same thing with instrumental jazz. I want to be set up close, but you know, you do what you got to do. So whatever the situation calls for is what is what we're going to have to do. Definitely. I wonder, um, I wonder if we're going to improve technology so that your in-ear monitors will sound much more natural, right? I, I mean, there are ways that we can implement technological advancements because, frankly, your fans want to hear you playing for, for as long as possible, right? They don't want you to get sick. So if there's a way to configure a stage where you feel like you're part of an intimate group but maybe you are maintaining a distance, but your ears are also feeling that intimate nature, you know, that may be the best of both worlds. This may be an opportunity for us to, um, to harness technology in ways that really make um, natural things like music even more beautiful and yet let you keep performing for your entire career. Well, you're right. I think the only the only uh, problematic part of that is that when you're when you're performing in larger venues uh, that have um, you know sound reinforcement support, it's already there and and it's doable. But when you're performing in smaller like uh, like coffee houses or restaurant bars or I, I perform at the Grove Winery with Bruce every year. It's a stage set up in a field, and they don't even have a PA. We uh, typically bring like one speaker, one small power speaker, so we don't have the means to to provide and like a uh, a good in-ear monitor system. But maybe that stuff will start to become more uh, affordable uh, or easier to deal with as a result of this, because I think we're going to have to change. Yeah, it definitely sounds like that. And the other thing, Doctor, that I've heard people talk about is they're wondering. You're talking about um, a month and a half in New York, maybe that same time of time frame here. So let's say two to three months from now for the Carolinas and some of the other places that are just now getting the initial impact and everything. That being said, there are I know in countries like Japan and China and some of the Asian countries, it's not unusual for people to be seen walking down the street with a mask. I mean, that is becoming more and more common here in North Carolina and definitely up there in New York. But do you think that this is something that we're going to see that's going to be almost the norm now, that, it, that we will see people all constantly wearing masks and that that will be the majority of the population and not the minority the way it's been in the past? So that's something that I have thought about for a long time. Uh, when this first started, I thought about the fact that, you know, everybody in China wears a mask and still this disease occurred, right? So it's not a panacea. 
the masks we're seeing right now, and I think it's because they are a novelty, oh, man, they are decked out. They are bedazzled and blinged, and they're beautiful. But, man, it seems so un-American to walk around with a mask on, you know, to go about <laughs> your, your normal day. Um, a lot of the reason that masks are worn, uh, for example, in Beijing before this, was because the level of pollution was so high there that you really couldn't breathe without some sort of filter. Um, I, uh, you know, maybe I'll be one of those dinosaurs who longs for the days when I could see my, my fellow countrymen's faces. I don't know. Uh, I think that, that remains to be, to be seen. And it may be that we don't wear it to walk around the street, but we do wear it to get into a crowded subway, let's say, something like that. So maybe we're just wearing it when we're going into more crowded environments, like you said, like the subway, or here we have mass transit with the public buses and things like that nature. So maybe it's, or if, I mean, we have a very popular uh, ball team here, the Durham Bulls. And I mean, I can't even envision going to a game and that's a game with many thousands of people. I mean, it's not like a New York Yankee stadium or our Met stadium, but we still got a pretty decent crowd. And I just can't even envision seeing tons of masks in front of this crowd. But I'm thinking that as we're going through this, that may be something that we face where we go into a game watching the Durham Bulls, which the movie was uh, loosely based on and everything. Yeah, yeah. And and we're seeing a bunch of people wearing masks. So I guess that may become the norm, but I don't know that I'll ever, like you, I may be a dinosaur and be longing for the days (laughs) where you could actually see the people's faces and watch them and see their reaction to the hits or their reactions to the um, the entertainment that might be happening on the field that's even unrelated to the game or just what's going on in the stands and everything. So I might be longing for those old days of those kind of things. But uh, we may be heading into a new day, unfortunately, where the mask has become very common. And the other thing I've heard is that um, how effective are these masks? Because like I said, I've heard the, of definitely um, the – I know the mask that is the surgical mask and the one – that uh, it has the end in the title. I know those are very effective, yeah. but some of these other masks, I'm not too sure about. I mean, some of them are scarves. I've heard well, about people that have used yeah, towels. And... Yeah, these masks are sort of like um, like your grandmother wrapping a scarf around her on a windy day, you know, kind of thing. So they're not, they're not going to – if you, you happen to go into a hospital ward, this is not the mask that's going to protect you. Um, and if you're sick, if you're really sick and spewing forth these virus every time you cough or, or uh, in fact, every time you speak, um, it's going to only protect to a certain level. So this is really good for that first level of protection. You go to the grocery store, you know, you're walking up and down the aisles, you have one level more of protection, so you're six feet away from the person in front of you, you're, you know, not coughing into your hands, um, you're coughing into your elbow or hopefully not coughing at all, um, and you've got a mask on to prevent yourself from sending viruses out and from somebody who doesn't know they're contagious, perhaps, from sending you some viruses. They're not effective in the hospital. So in the hospital, we want nurses and doctors and healthcare workers, x-ray techs, you know, even the security guard, like whoever is working in the hospital – we want them to be protected, and that's, they need the, they're called N95 masks and N95 respirators. And those really seal against your face and really make a very tight seal that works very effectively to prevent you from getting viruses and, in fact, giving viruses to somebody else. Now, I'll tell you, the reason we need to take these precautions is that you could be walking around right as rain and still have the virus and be contagious. And 80% of people won't end up going to the hospital. They'll have what we call a mild case. But a mild case feels awful. A mild case is sort of like the four or five worst flus you ever had put together with muscle aches and pains and it hurts to breathe and maybe you're shaking and you're feverish. You're just not bad enough to go into an emergency room. So you, the reason you're wearing a mask is you don't know if you're contagious, you don't know if the person next to you is contagious, and the more we can distance ourselves and prevent that kind of spread, 
the less likely we're going to see those really bad 